Well, our next guest thinks some of the gloom in Brussels and Athens might be misplaced and argues that the United States still has much to learn from Europe's social and economic policies. Stephen Hill is the author of Europe's Promise, Why the European Way is the Best Hope for an Insecure Age. He directs a political reform program at the New America Foundation. His previous books include Ten Steps to Repair American Democracy and Fixing Elections, the Failure of America's Winner-Take-All Politics. Stephen Hill joins us now from Washington, D.C. Welcome to Democracy Now! First, talk about the crisis in Greece and Europe's response. Well, the, uh, the crisis there is uh, I, the world has gone through a, a huge economic shock, and, and we're, we're seeing and are going to continue to see uh, various aftershocks that um, we're seeing not only in places like Greece, but we've seen in California, where I actually live, uh, where you had a state uh, that is 14 percent of the of the GDP of the United States that is uh, also was threatening to default and ended up having to issue IOUs in order to pay um, its debts. And so these are the sorts of things that are occurring in in Europe as well. Um, what's different in Europe is that uh, in, in the United States, we're used to the federal government being a backstop for states, for example, whereas in Europe, there's really not a, a tradition of any other states like Germany and France, which are the stronger partners in the European Union, being a backstop for a country like Greece. And so that's what a lot of the uh, back and forth discussion that we're seeing right now, a lot of the anxiety. But just recently, uh, it looks like France and Germany have, in fact, agreed to be sort of a, a financial backstop. And um, as a result, the markets have calmed and order is returned, so to speak. But what's being lost here, of course, is what happens to people when these sorts of things happen. Um, and just like we're seeing in California, layoffs, furloughs, the city of Los Angeles just uh, laid off a thousand people. Uh, this is the type of thing that um, is, is going to affect Greece to some extent. But I think it's also important to keep a, a, a broader perspective about this. Greece is only. 2 percent of Europe's economy. Um, Europe itself only has a, a deficit to GDP ratio of about 6 percent, compared to the United States, which has a deficit to GDP ratio of 10.5 percent, and California, which is 14 percent of the American economy. So there's, there's an anal anal analogies here that go on both sides of the Atlantic. Well, in your book, you posit that most Americans are not really aware of the enormous uh, change in direction and capitalism has taken in Europe uh, since World War II. You actually say at one point that European Union is an entirely new species of human organization, the likes of which the world has never seen. It marks a new evolutionary stage in supranational and supranational development in the way it links and closely integrates entire regions of nation states economically and politically. How does this work now in this particular situation of the Greek crisis? And, and what do you th uh, think it, is the most important lesson that Americans must learn about how the European Union uh, is dealing with its economic crises? Well, I mean, for example, while Greece is going through this uh, deficit issue, um, the people there all still have health care. Uh, you know, Greece has universal health care for all, um, unlike in the United States or California, where you have millions of people that have no health care at all. Um, they have a much more generous support for workers who get laid off. They have paid parental leave, paid sick leave. They have more generous retirement, more vacations. Um, and, you know, whereas Americans, when we go through this, really don't have any of that at all. And that's still uh, present in Greece and in other countries of Europe throughout any kind of crisis like this. They start trimming a little bit at the edges, but even so, that what remains is still far more than what any American would enjoy. But the thing to, that's important to realize is that um, these sorts of things have been portrayed as something that undermines the uh, European economy vis-a-vis -vis the American ep economy. But, in fact, there, when you really look at the numbers, there's no truth to it whatsoever. Europe has the largest economy in the world. It's almost a third of the world's, world's economy. In fact, it's almost as large as the United States and China's economy combined. Europe has more Fortune 500 companies than China and the United States combined. It has um, more small businesses that produce two-thirds of the jobs uh, compared to uh, in the United States, where small business produces about only half the jobs. And so, and it, however you want to measure it, the European economy is robust and um, 
and it's 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 vibrant. But what Europe has managed to do is to figure out how do we harness this ability of capitalism to create wealth? Because there's no question that capitalism creates a lot of wealth, but there's an outstanding question here of what do we do with that wealth? Whose pockets does that money go into? Europe has figured out a way to harness this wealth and create a more broadly shared prosperity that all of their people enjoy in, even in the midst of an economic crisis like this, whereas the United States, we're still trying to figure it out. We can't even figure out how to give health care to all our people or to get 60 votes in the United States Senate, you know, where the, the filibuster has gone wild. So uh, in many, many ways, Europe is doing fine through this crisis, where we in the United States here are really having difficult times. One of the things you also raise is the how Europe uh, decided after World War II basically not to demilitarize, but to certainly reduce uh, its expenditures on uh, uh, on armies and on weapons, and this has enabled it to be able to provide a, a better life for its citizens. Could you talk about that to some extent? Certainly. Uh, Europe uh, was a military, uh, a, a place of military warring nations for centuries. And after the, the utter destruction of World Wars I and II, um, the politicians of Europe, interestingly, the conservative politicians of Europe, people like Konrad Adenauer from Germany and Winston Churchill from the UK, they decided that it was time to quit pouring their nation's wealth into. Um, into the military machines they had been and to start pouring it into their people. So a movement emerged uh, for what was called then the social market economy. In my book, I call it social capitalism, to start taking the resources of their uh, free markets and plowing it back into developing their people, giving things like, for example, free or nearly free university education, which Europe still has today, um, whereas, you know, in the United States, students are paying increasingly amount uh, for tuition, having um, child care in the United States, a, a child care for, t for two children is about $12,000 per year for a family. In the United States, you're, uh, in, in Europe, you're paying $1,000 to maybe $2,000 per year for that same child care. Um, and, and so Europe plowed it back into these things in order to develop uh, these, these um, things for their people. And they also did other things that I think is of great interest that I, many people in the United States have not heard about, um, in order to, in a sense, put some uh, regulations around corporate power, Germany was the first to develop a practice known as co-determination, where the, um, you know, every corporation has a board of directors. But in Germany, 50 percent of those board members are elected by the workers. Uh, in Sweden, a third of the board members are elected by the workers. It, was be, it, was, it would be as if Walmart were required by law to, re, to allow its workers to elect 50 percent of its board of directors. It's almost unimaginable from the American point of view, and yet here you have major economies in Europe that actually do this on a fairly regular basis, and yet most Americans have never even heard about this. Uh, Stephen Hill, can you explain who the pigs are? The pigs are the name that's being given to—it's an acronym for Portugal, um, Italy or Ireland, depending on who's using it, uh, Greece and Spain. And this is the feeling, uh, the, the group that they put together of, of countries that they feel may default on um, the, the loans that they have in order to fund their, their budget deficits. Um, you know, it's it, certainly whenever you have the big budget deficits that these countries have run up. Um, but, but I should mention that the United States has run up a budget deficit almost as large. Our, our deficit to GDP ratio in the United States is 10.5 percent compared to 12.7 percent in Greece. Not that much different. Um, it, those, but it's still, it's of concern, yet I think it's being a bit overblown, because um, is lo what's new here is that France and Germany and the other countries that are more healthily uh, economically are being asked to be backstops for the uh, for their uh, fellow nations in the Europe, Eurozone that um, are not doing as well. But again, this is something that in the United States, um, the federal government does for states here all the time already. It's, it's really a matter of what does Europe do going forward. And what Europe is saying with the recent news is that uh, the, the, the better off countries are going to agree to be that backstop for what's being called the pigs, um, such as, as Greece and Portugal and others.